Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And today for forest management, we're going to talk about population growth or the dynamics of it. Hey, we've talked about age calculations and back calculating age. We've talked about tree height and other things. These are measurements that are important, but the overarching overall overall goal of a population manager or forest manager is to manage your population. So you got to know population trends. So that's kind of why I want to talk about population growth. We're also going to talk about some other components to population as we progress. But this is very important that you know how to calculate whether your population is growing, declining, and at what point can you expect your population to kind of stabilize? Okay, so that's what we're going to get at. Now, this all population growth all really came from a period of human population growth. And um, I don't know if he was the first, but he's one of the very first people to write about population growth. And that was Thomas Malthus. If you remember from maybe general biology or some other courses that you might have had, Thomas Malthus was the individual who wrote a book on human populations and, and basically stated that human populations have the capability of outgrowing their food resources. Darwin read this book. Darwin used Thomas Malthus's ideas about humans and population growth, and he basically transcended that on to all organisms and said that, well, it's not just humans that have the possibility of over-reproducing, but all organisms have the possibility of over-reproducing. And thus came out uh, his theory of natural selection. Uh, in other words, only the individuals that are best fit for the given environment are the individuals that live and survive and reproduce. Okay, so really that came from human population biology but regardless of that okay we can look at human population biology you know now okay we're sitting at 2020 and we're really close to 8 billion people in the world um okay the way that we look at population biology or population growth of human populations is by trends okay um you know that really our population started exploding right after world war ii with the industrial revolution okay this is where you could start you know better farming better industrialization the you know better use of resources or uh, i shouldn't say maybe not better use of resources more abundant use of resources and you just see a huge spike in population growth of humans. I mean, if you look, we were sitting at about 1 billion. Okay, this graph isn't really showing it, but we're sitting about 1 billion from 1850 all the way to like 1550. So, you know, close to 300 years, the world's population was 1 billion. Okay, And, you know, we haven't even added 200 years since then. But when we get add 200 years since 1850 and we get to 2050, we're expecting 9 billion. So that means it, we sat at 1 billion for 300 years. And before that, we were less than 1 billion. Okay? The last 200 years, we've added about 8 billion people to the planet. And more importantly, the last 100 years, we've added 5 billion people, or we will have added 5, maybe 6 billion. We've added 5 right now, but by the time we get to 10, or 2050, okay, from 1950 to 2050, the last 100 years, we will have added roughly 5 billion, 6 billion people, okay? Just depends on where the population lands, okay? That's a big deal, right? Now, the reason why that's a big deal is we don't quite know what the carrying capacity is, what's the top out for humans. Now, in 
the 1970s, okay, it was thought to be about 9 billion. Okay? With better technology, better medicine, more advances, we think now that it could be close to 12 billion. But there will be a point where the population on the planet reaches its carrying capacity. You really, you can't add any more to the positive growth of the population. Based on this curvature and based on this trend, it looks like, you know, it's going to be close to that 12 billion because the, the, the curve, the graph is starting to slope off. We don't really know um, if it is 9 billion. Uh, you can expect to reach 9 billion by 2050. So for most of you in your lifetime, in the next 30 years, um, it will be possibly close to that carrying capacity. If it's, you know, 12 billion, then most of you don't have to worry about it. Okay, that's going to be way out there. But regardless, when you get close to that carrying capacity, things start happening. Okay, um, Death rate has to increase because you're reaching a point where your resources or something is making it so your population can't grow as fast. Okay, we'll come back to that when we start looking at other examples. So again, Malthus did this to begin with. He described this mathematically. That's what we're going to do. We're going to use an equation, a couple equations, to predict what a population is going to be or to track how much population growth um, a group of trees might have or some kind of vegetation might have. First of all, <clears throat> a capitalized N in most, most ecology or population um, examples, the capital N means you're talking about the total population. Okay? In some cases, you know the total population. In other cases, that's what you're trying to figure out is the total population. If you remember a definition of population, it's the same number or the total number of species in a given region that have the capability of reproducing. Okay, When we're talking about population, we're talking about a single species population. We're not combining species. Okay, So population is species specific. Okay? The rate or little r is the rate of growth. The rate of growth is determined by lots of different things. Okay? It's determined by how many offspring an organism can produce, how many of those offspring um, are going to die. Okay, so birth rate, death rate, how many individuals are coming into your population, how many individuals are leaving your population, immigration, immigration, okay, and a lot of birth rate and death rate is determined by lots of different situations or characteristics, okay? Time, time depends on what organism you're talking about, okay? If we're talking about an organism that reproduces every five years, then your time is a five-year period, every five years. If you're talking about an organism that can reproduce every month, then, you know, it's monthly reproduction. Okay? So you have to realize you got to know your organism because this population is species-specific. The time unit is species-specific. The rate of growth is species-specific. Okay, because different organisms reproduce different number of offspring. Those offspring have a different capability of survival, okay, and they reproduce those offspring at a different period of time or unit of time. Okay, so this using these three variables, we can get a geometric rate of increase, or what we would often call an exponential growth rate. Okay, so this is the ideal rate at which a population can grow or change under certain circumstances, okay? And when we say certain circumstances, we say ideal circumstances. So that means that your rate of growth is not based on, you know, food resources, so um, nutrient levels, so you're not having a lack of 
phosphorus or lack of nitrogen, you know, having a lack of water when we're talking about forests, okay, if we're talking about other populations like animal populations, you don't have a lack of food resources, those kind of things, okay. So under ideal circumstances, ideal situation, the geometric rate of increase is this equation, okay. Population at time, whatever time this is, okay, so maybe we're interested what the population will be 20 years from now, okay. You have the current population at time zero, the rate at which it grows, and then by, you know, raised to the time at which you're talking about, okay. And so we'll look at some examples of this to make it a little more clear. Well, because this is ideal circumstances, this will result in exponential growth curve, okay? The growth is going to increase per unit of time, okay? So geometric increase per unit of time, and it has no limit, okay? So it's a constant rate. So if you're adding 50 new individuals every single year, okay? then you're adding 50 new individuals every single year. Or better yet, if each individual in your population is reproducing two offspring every single year, then that's going to result in an exponential growth curve that expedites very quickly, okay? So it goes from maybe a very small population to a huge population very fast. That's exponential growth. It's often represented as a J curve. Okay, so let's look at a typical example of exp exponential growth. We often use insects because they grow exponentially, um, especially things like cockroaches and flies. Um, they can grow exponentially and, and often do. Their populations often grow exponentially. Other organisms like trees and other vegetation, maybe some weeds, weeds will grow exponentially, okay? But most of the vegetation that a forest manager might be interested in is not going to grow exponentially, and I'll, I'll talk about why that is, okay? But let's look at exponential growth rate with cockroaches first. So let's say that a cockroach reproduces 10 offspring, okay, every three months, okay? So your rate of increase or your little r is 10 offspring, okay? Your period, your time period is three months, okay? So then we, we need to then calculate this out. So let's say your original population, you have two cockroaches. Your rate is 10, okay? So your time one, your first three months is going to be, your population is going to be 20 individuals. So if we jump over to time two, your new population is 20 individuals. That's what you had from the first three months. Now you're looking at the second three months. Your rate is still 10. Nothing's changed. Okay. But now you have 200 individuals after the, you know, after the second three month period. So in six months, you went from two individuals to 200 individuals. Okay. In nine months, you made it to 2,000 individuals. In 12 months, you're at 20,000 individuals. So this is how exponential growth rate works. It takes a very little bit, little input because of some resource is available at maximum level, okay? So that population is allowed to skyrocket and you know jump in number very quickly. So if you can see here, this is, you know, cockroaches, you know, starting off maybe two individuals, gradually increases two to 20 to 200, okay, and then 2,000, and then boom, 20,000. And then if we did it again, you know, maybe we're at, well, whatever 20,000 times 10 is, so 200,000, right? Yeah, 200,000. So, um, that's how populations can grow exponentially. And you can see that J curve look right there. Okay. All right. So we know that 
populations don't typically grow continuously forever. Okay? When they start off, they might have that J curve, that exponential growth curve. But in reality, something will something will make it so that population has to slow. Their growth rate has to slow. Okay? So when we're talking about that original equation that we're talking about, exponential growth rate, this is another way to write it. You can just write, you know, change in n, change in time is equal to the rate times n. Okay? So d is delta, which, you know, means change. And again, n is your population. Time is whatever time you're talking about. R is your rate of growth times the population. Okay? So the change in population per change in time is equal to the rate times population size. Okay? That's how you can rewrite exponential growth curve. Okay? And that's probably the equation that you would like to use or should use is R times N. So again, that's exponential growth. Okay? There's the equation written out. Okay? I highly suggest that you memorize this equation. Um, or have it handy because you're probably going to have to use it on a quiz or an exam. Okay? Plus, it's just an easy equation to talk about how a population can increase. Now, remember that R itself is going to change. Okay? It's, it's species specific. So R, so, you know, in cockroaches, maybe this is 10 per individual. Maybe in maybe in a in a tree, maybe it's a hundred thousand seeds per year, but only two get germinated. Okay, so just because you reproduce a hundred thousand seeds doesn't mean your R is a hundred thousand. Okay, it's the number of offspring that survive. That's R. Okay. So you have to, R is actually birth minus the death plus immigration minus emigration. That's what R really is. So you take your birth rate minus your death rate. And so let's say you are reproducing 100,000 seeds, but 998,000 or 9... <laughs> 98,099, sorry, 99,998 die. Okay, so you're left with two seeds that germinate. That's your R, okay? And it's often written as a percent. So a certain percent will germinate. A certain percent will survive. Maybe it's 0.001% will survive. So even though you might produce 100,000, 200,000, millions of seeds, if 0.0001% survive, that's your R. Okay? Times that by your population size. Okay? That's how you get exponential growth. But exponential growth always has its limits. So even though that cockroach population looks like it's just skyrocketing going to keep on going eventually it will reach its carrying capacity or its k that is determined by something okay it's not always the same thing okay so exponential growth will always be limited by something okay what those limits are is depending on the species it depends on the area so it could be that we're talking about tree growth. We've clear cut a forest. We have, you know, left a couple seed trees. They deposit all their seeds. Some of those germinate. You get lots of little saplings, but you have, you know, poor nutrients. You have very little phosphorus, very little nitrogen in the region. Okay? So you have poor nutrients. So your population is not going J, it's reaching a carrying capacity. The nice thing about carrying capacity is that can change. It changes over time. 
Okay. Or maybe you have a huge population growth, tons of saplings come up, and now you have trees shading out other trees. So now your carrying capacity is based on sunlight. It's based on how much light can reach the bottom of the canopy to those trees below. Okay. It could be how many predators are there in a population. So how many herbivores are in the population to consume material? It could, could be based on disease. It could be based, based on water availability. Okay, so carrying capacity is always going to limit your population size. Okay, so shortages of food or any other kind of resources can lead to a reduction of the population size. So that's carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the top end. How much of some resource, food, water, sunlight, space, how much of that resource can be dedicated to the population? Okay. Now, your carrying capacity, even though your carrying capacity is very species specific, you also have to take in the other species around because they determine your carrying capacity also. So let's say your carrying capacity for a forest that is, you know, one acre by one acre, okay? small little little patch of forest. Maybe the carrying capacity for that given acre by acre <clears throat> might be, you know, 10,000 trees. Small poplar trees, 10,000 of them can fit acre by acre. Okay. Well, what happens if you have other trees come in? Maybe you have some pines come in. Maybe you have some ground vegetation that comes in that starts stealing up water resources or nutrient resources. Okay. Maybe you have some other species in there that's now competing. Now your carrying capacity isn't 10,000. Your carrying capacity might be 8,000 with these other trees available or in that region okay? or this other vegetation, okay? So carrying capacity, again, is that top end, okay? Now, a lot of organisms, forests included, they overshoot their carrying capacity. So when a seed, when a tree reproduces seeds, it doesn't logically think, "Oh, I'm only going to reproduce a hundred thousand with a germination of five individuals uh, this year because we're getting close to carrying capacity." No, that thing, that tree is going to reproduce as many seeds as it can as many seeds as it has nutrients to reproduce. Okay? So maybe it will reproduce 2 million seeds and 50 individuals are going to germinate. But because those 50 individuals are going to germinate, now you've overshot your carrying capacity because all the trees are reproducing as much as they can. Maybe the amount of water was the limiting resource and you had very good rainfall that year. So all these trees are all reproducing at their maximum and you overshoot carrying capacity because you had, you know, this one fluke year where you had really good water and you overshoot. And what happens when you overshoot is when you get back to the normal carrying capacity now your population's over it and the next year when water resources are at their norm that population crashes and you have the huge die off okay, because of scarcity of some type of resource it could be water it could be nutrient it could be sunlight it could be you know there's lots of different situations it could be that there's less predators in the population um, could be there's less squirrels or scavengers that are going to eat seeds or nuts or fruits or something like that. Um, and you you have a higher germination rate because you have less competition for the seeds. Um, there's lots of things that can cause that. 
Okay, overshooting can cause your population to crash. Now, how bad the crash is depends on a lot of things, okay? First of all, why did you overshoot? How much did you overshoot? Okay. And then secondly, how bad or how much has the carrying capacity changed? So did at the same time that you overshot, that the next year is your K much lower? Then your crash can be really heavy. Okay. And you can crash well below the carrying capacity. Okay, we'll look at this. Um, a lot of populations do this often. Um, it, they're called boom and bust populations. So they'll explode, send out tons of seeds, population grows very rapidly, overshoots carrying capacity, crashes. Okay, cockroaches, you know, fleas, flies. Lots of weeds, so halogeton, um, Russian thistle, uh, different types of grasses will do this, crabgrass, um, other kinds of plants will shoot out millions of seeds. And then due to the carrying capacity, they've way overshot the K. So there's not enough nutrients, not enough water, not enough some, something in the in that region for them to sustain, and the population crashes. Okay. So for long-lived organisms, it's often not as drastic of crash because what happens is the population is reproducing, and it keeps reproducing and reproducing at a given rate. But then due to a lack of some resource, that population growth starts to slow. Okay, and that's what you're seeing with the human population. When you saw that curve, okay, we, we reached our maximum probably somewhere around 2000, maximum growth rate, maybe, the, maybe earlier than that, 1990s, maximum growth rate. And then we started to kind of trickle. Still growing still going towards your carrying capacity, but you're not at what we typically call MSY or maximum sustainable yield, okay? We're gonna talk about that in a second. Maximum sustainable yield is what a lot of managers try to keep their population at, and I'll talk about it. So this slowing of the rate of growth, moving from an exponential growth rate to what we call a logistic growth rate, will change your growth curve from a J to an S, okay? And that's because your population is gradually reaching that carrying capacity or that population is gradually becoming more resource scarce, okay? And this is the, the typical for most populations on the planet. Even cockroach populations are going to reach a point where that population starts to slow. Now, in some cases, it's too late and they overshoot the carrying capacity and then they crash. But for a lot of them, as long as the growth rate slows or the, their food source is slow, you'll have more deaths or your deaths and your births are gonna be closer to each other. So your rate of growth starts to slow and they'll reach a carrying capacity, okay? And so that's the logistic growth curve. This is the mathematical formula for that. The only real difference here that we're talking about is you have a K now, okay? So there are lots of ways to write this. You're gonna see other equations, but K is included. So your R is the same thing. It's your rate of growth. Your N is your population, okay? and your K is your carrying capacity. So you have to know how many individuals can that given region support, okay? Then at that point, you can calculate what we call a logistic growth curve. A logistic growth curve, okay, will often look sigmoidal, okay? This is showing you a, a typical logistic growth curve, 
of a pop of most populations because what will happen is you have slow growth rate so let's say a new area happens okay let's say you have a fire you know sweep the landscape and it's it's an extreme fire it burns everything okay your first population is going to be those pioneer species etc okay but let's skip over those they're going to have the same kind of growth as this but let's talk about some trees that will come in so let's say your you know your first trees are going to be some pines that are going to come in okay? so some ponderosa pines that are going to come in and you might just have a few you know seeds that are carried in probably by some animals transferring them in etc from a from a forest nearby all right so you get few individuals population starts to grow expand because you have this open area there's really no fighting for resources all you're fighting against is some grasses and, and annuals maybe some a little bit of perennials but once the trees get up there they're stealing the sunlight they're stealing more nutrients their roots go deeper okay they can they can definitely get um established fast okay and they start going and going and going and at this point about half of k is the fastest rate of growth okay that's what we call the maximum sustainable yield this is where your r is at its maximum is half of k okay we'll come back to that again but this population keeps going keeps going keeps going and now it's starting to reach its resource decline so now you're starting to see that birth rates and death rates are getting closer to each other so your r is starting to slow and you can start to see that slope is changing so it's going from a j curve to an s curve and even at that this population still can overshoot carrying capacity so it overshoots the carrying capacity, it crashes, okay, and it overshoots again, it crashes a little bit, and this is what a lot of populations will do, and we expect this to be true of pretty much every population, is once you reach carrying capacity, if nothing else changes and, and it's a pretty stable environment, you should see a cyclic movement around carrying capacity up and down up and down up and down now some years it's going to be a large uplift and then a very drastic downlift and then other years if k is very stable you might not even see the blip over k it might just be pretty much a straight line okay but remember a very key component to this is carrying capacity changes your k will change your K is dictated by something, a limiting resource, water, nutrients, something, sunlight, space, something. Okay, so K can change. Now, space, if you only have a certain amount of space, maybe we're talking about an island, okay, unless water is rising and the island is shrinking, your K is pretty much constant. Okay. But in other regions, if it's space and, you know, you have a forest and then next to it, you, you might have some grasslands, you could get some encroachment onto the grasslands or vice versa. The grasslands could be encroaching on the forest. So your K could be shrinking or it could be growing. OK, again, K can change. Nutrient levels can change. Um, often this occurs in new established forests. The nutrient lo levels are great because pioneer species came in, they you know got established, they died, they nutrient load the soil. Trees come in, suck up those nutrients, okay, and the more coniferous trees you have, okay, the worse your soils are going to be. So your carrying capacity might be dictated by how poor your soils are because now you don't have new nutrients really coming in or not very much say so, so that might be your carrying capacity and unless you have some kind of new nutrients come in maybe that means that you have aspen or poplar 
or some tree that drops it leave, its leaves come in and get established. Oaks come in and get established, start dropping leaves in that region, increasing the level of nutrients in that region so you can get more pines um, and your carrying capacity can change. Okay, so it really just depends on, you know, the population. Now, as a manager, let's say you're managing your own forest, if nutrients is your, your carrying capacity, if that's what's making it so you can't plant more trees per square foot, then you fertilize your forest. Okay? And that's what a lot of managers on plantation, tree plantations do. Okay? They don't want nutrients to be the limiting source, so they just add nitrogen, they add phy phosphorus to the soil. Those are the two, typically the two limiting nutrients in a forest. So you're just adding nitrogen and phosphorus to the forest so you can increase your carrying capacity. Now, always you're going to reach, when we're talking about trees, you're always going to reach your carrying capacity with light penetration or available light. Okay, You can only have trees so dense okay, and so much shading that occurs before the tree can't do enough photosynthesis to maintain itself. Okay, So that's important to know. But prior to reaching that point, a lot of forests will be nutrient deficient or water deficient. Okay, and you can add those two resources. And, and often um, managers of plantations like that, they'll do so. Okay, so again, I told you you could rewrite that equation a little bit differently. Okay, and it's more meaningful, in my opinion, to write it this way as your growth is equal to your rate of growth or rate of change times your population, okay, times K minus N or your carrying capacity minus your current population divided by K. That K minus N is very important because as your population gets close to K, eventually when K and N are the same, this is going to be zero. Okay, so your rate of growth is going to be zero. Okay? If your N overshoots K, this is going to be negative, and actually your rate of growth is going to be negative, which means your population is actually declining. Okay. So again, these are the two models that we're talking about: exponential growth, okay, that J model. Okay, uh, again, exponential growth will always reach a carrying capacity. Okay. And then sigmoidal, sigmoidal growth or logistic growth curve, okay, where you get this kind of trickle and you're slowly reaching carrying capacity. Again, it's not going to be a straight line on carrying capacity. It's probably going to have some overshoot, some little bit of, you know, up and down cyclic around that K. And then if K changes, you could see another blip, you know, where you got to reach that K or if K goes down, you got, you're going to have a crash where your population is going to crash back down to that K. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about maximum sustainable yield. It's really important as a tool in wildlife management, but forest managers use this also. Okay. Because if you know something about the trees that you're managing, you know something about the carrying capacity that you have, then you know what the maximum growth is going to be. Now, it's not important because you're not harvesting these organisms at a really young age. For mo most, most managers are not, okay? So you're harvesting these organisms at a certain size, typically. And that's probably over this maximum sustainable yield. But what this does for forest managers is it tells them at what point in time can you expect your forest to be its most productive in germination and seed and, and growth? And then at what point in time can you expect your rate of growth 
to basically be nil. Okay? Now, if that rate of growth is nil, then this might actually tell you how many trees you should leave on the landscape. Okay, so even though this time period, so let's say it takes 20 years for the population to get to a point where it's maximum growth, and it takes another 20 years for that population to reach carrying capacity. Okay, well, you can cut out 20 years if you only knock your population back down to its maximum sustainable yield, its population size here. Okay? If you knock it down to here, then your rate of growth can you know, expand to that. Okay, so you just take that 20 years off and you knock your population back to its maximum sustainable yield or maximum sustainable population size. This is where they're going to re be reproducing the most efficiently and they're going to be adding back into, into the population. Then when you get back to your K, you remove all the large trees that were basically seed trees here and knock it back down to maximum sustainable yield and you keep doing that. There are individuals, there are forest managers that use these models to drop your population to half of its K and allow for it to bounce back up. Drop your population to half K, allow for it to bounce back up. You're cutting off years of your forest, years of your harvest by doing so. Now, it's a lot more intensive when it comes to cutting or removing of forest material because you're not able to go in and remove trees you know, with machinery, often you're having to, you know, go in and remove it with saws and, and actively remove trees that way. So for some individuals, this doesn't work at all because, you know, you're interested in cutting your entire plantation, replanting it, moving over to the next section of your plantation, okay, cutting that one, replanting it, et cetera, et cetera. And you just rotate through your acreage, cutting your trees. But for some individuals, this is, you know, cutting years off of your forest because your growth rate is so high here. Okay. All right. So with that being said, you can expect to see some homework um, or some assignment that you, you get to do calculating population growth. It's important to be able to calculate both exponential growth and logistic growth because in some situations you might need to know well what's the exponential growth of this newly planted forest um or you know this single seed tree that i left on this one acre what's the exponential growth rate going to look like okay or what's the logistic growth rate going to look like 20 years down the road okay. so with that okay we'll see you next time